There's a cat that is very close to the window, which is surprising for how high up I am. It's on the roof of the neighboring building. Hmm. To be a cat. I was wondering if I open this window, whether we'll just randomly get a cat coming in. To nice. <laughs> yeah, you could use another cat. Yeah. Well, I don't think the others would appreciate the invader. No, no. <laughs> there will be That bad. happened before. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I remember my old place up on the, whatever that was, seventh floor. It came from you the neighboring balcony. <laughs> yeah, it came from the other <laughs> balcony on ours. I just heard, like, growling and hissing. They were looking at each other from the... Uh, separated by the by pane of yes. glass. And then, yep. My dog once fought a coyote through a fence. Nice. She felt pretty tough about it, I think. That, I would, too. That's, that's an impressive yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the fence helped. You know, her feeling of being a big dog. Yeah, but yeah. It's still, it's a showdown with a coyote. It was a showdown with a coyote. Yeah. Yeah. You know, at this point, having so many Sopo episodes, you could say that Sopo is like our thing, you know? The thing, this thing of ours? ours? This well, thing of ours, yeah. I don't know if I want to say that. Yeah? For various reasons. Oh, yeah. because of all the horrible people and extreme violence for stupid reasons? Yes, that being one of them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, let's hear about the others on The Empire Never Ended. Ooh. With Boris, Fritz, and Ray. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. 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 Boris, Fritz, and Ray here. Oh. And they're here to talk about organized crime. Who's this guy? I don't know. He's coming Where's this guy come from? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, actually, not crime. yet. Not yet. <laughs> no, um, no, no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping no. the gun here, but uh, organized <laughs> crime for you today. Well. We didn't talk about Sopo in a long time, so I figured we need some kind of a recap. So, uh, you know, we had two episodes long time ago in mm. this arc that were about the Serbian National Defense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then we had two more, like, premium episodes that were focused, on, uh, like, on kind of, let's say, black hand offshoots. Um, so... Those four episodes could be called our Black Hand episodes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And then after that, we had seven episodes about <laughs> Sopo. Yep. Uh, I mean, seven free episodes. I think there were some premium that were attached to that as well. That's like a lot. The, yeah, like the CIA Kavaya one. Yes, yes. That's a lot for a bunch of drunks who failed to kill Tito. Yeah. So this, I think, I want to... For this to be the last Sopo episode, like Sopo number eight, or you can also call it, you know, uh, Serbian National Defense number 11 episode, mm -hmm. or Black or, Hand number 30. Uh, Black Hand number, I think, 13. Um, <laughs> Damn. 13 yes. uh, is a good number. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so, and that's like what I want to connect all of these things that we talked uh, about so far. I don't want to give too much new information in this episode. Uh, and then in the next three episodes, the next two free episodes will be the continuation of this story, but I think we can give it a new name. Like basically it's the next two episodes will be like Serbian mob one and two. The other, <laughs> or like, the other or black like, hands, finally. the Italian or like, mafia. Or maybe because it will be like a kind of a, just a, like scratching the surface of the topic of Serbian in Yugoslav. Organized crime, it, it can be maybe even called like Serbian Mob Zero and Serbian Mob Zero Point One or something like this. Mm. Um, yeah, well, why complicate it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, that, that will be sort of the conclusion of the Sopo story that, I mean, it direct, directly ties into it. Um, and I kind of tried to tie into Sopo also to the Black Hand story and the Serbian National mm -hmm. Defense story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and then this will be, an in the next two, three episodes will be a kind of an introduction to some future arc where we'll be go more in-depth into the whole 
you know, Yugoslav 90s wars and organized crime and deep state. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the idea is now to kind of go through some of these things that we already talked to in a chronological order, the, uh, the best that I can, and they're directly connected to the next two episodes, will, which will be about the organized crime. All right. Pretty, uh, pretty ambitious task you made yourself yeah. there, Ray. <laughs> I did, uh, and as preparation, I listened to 20 hours of our podcasts. Wow. wow. What did, what did that, that do to you? Uh, I mean, nothing, really. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's just like... <laughs> <laughs> um, it's all it's, you know I'm, I made model, most of those episodes so it was mm-hmm. like already you know it's a kind of oh yeah we, we are into some strange things in a, <laughs> and do it in like in a lot of details uh, mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. Yeah. so yeah. I, um, I just kind of took some notes great which in Ray's case is always you know 30 pages and we're not exaggerating uh, yeah. in this case it's not because it's a kind of a summary episode so I, I just have like seven pages of notes. Oh, look oh, at you. All right. Look at you. Yeah. So all you got to do to get your notes down to seven pages is make 20 odd episodes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> it takes what it takes. Yeah. All right. So uh, enough of these uh, Croats, right? We're going back <laughs> to the Serbs. <laughs> We're going back to Serbia, yeah. And, well, uh, you know, the 19th century. Uh, okay, I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> Our favorite I'm century. Gonna, I'm going to say two sentences about the 19th century, okay? All right, all right. So we, I mean, it's almost like the 18th century because, okay, so the, the big event is the, the first Serbian uprising and the second Serbian <laughs> uprising, also called the Serbian Revolution. But this process starts in 1804, and this is when the modern Serbian nation state was created first Ta-da. as a kind of a, kind of a de facto independent state still in the ottoman empire and then also internationally recognized independent state in this process also the two serbian like domestic dynasties were formed the karadjordjevic dynasty and the brenovic dynasty which would you know switch in the throne some of them mm-hmm. would get assassinated yep there was lots of stuff going on Some there. spectacularly assassinated Yes, Indeed. some of that we will mention in this episode uh, soon. Uh, one assassination, at least. Uh, and also, not only though these two dynasties, but lot, lots of important people and lots of people who will become rich and like a political political dynasties were also came from this period of these uprisings against the the Turkish state. Uh, like, uh, you know, as you know, you would. Um, I mean, it's pre- pretty logical that the people who, you know, uh, had important positions in these uprisings were the ones who were then later in a good position to get rich or have political influence and so on. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, in the late 19th century, the Obrenovic dynasty is in power uh, in Serbia, also in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, they... Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, Serbia is really politically uh, attached to Austro-Hungary, which is a huge uh, empire in Europe, basically surrounding Serbia, which is quite a small state, not much bigger than it was in 1804. Mm-hmm. A little bit bigger, but not that much. Um, this so Austro-Hungary uh, is sort of an ally of Serbia at this point, but it's not a traditional ally. Um, Serbia is more like inclined to be politically close to Russia because mm-hmm. of various historical reasons and also to Western allies in Western Europe like France. Right. So this, this you know, alliance with Austro-Hungary is not very popular and it's also not very, like it's, for many, it's not seen as good um, for the Serbian state, because Austro-Hungary has like a kind of a monopolistic position. They control most of Serbian export and import, and basically the economy is completely tied to them. Mm-hmm. Um, also, the, the Obrenovic rule, like first of King Milan and then his son King Alexander, is not very popular. It's quite autocratic, anti-democratic, and so this is another reason why they are not popular. Mm-hmm. So in 1903, a group of uh, officers in the Serbian military 
start a conspiracy to get rid of the king and they execute this conspiracy by executing the king. They literally just killed the king and the queen and it was, you know, a bit of a massacre. They uh, mm. killed them with their guns and swords and slashed their bodies and threw them off the balcony. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. Potent. What? Potent. Ah. So, uh, this was sort of the end of the Ubrenovich dynasty. Uh, the, 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 the guy who was proclaimed king uh, at that point came out of exile. Uh, you know, he lived abroad because he was from the competing dynasty, the Karadjordjevic dynasty, and this was Petar or Peter who was proclaimed king of Serbia in 1903. This was not uh, like seen as like a, a positive development by well, no one like outside of Serbia really, because at that point most of uh, states in Europe were monarchies, and even not all of them were in good relations with the Austro-Hungary. They were all, you know, all of these kings and queens are relatives, and also they don't like when uh, you know commoners kill kings and such things. Yeah, so this right. was lots of states cut their uh, like um, diplomatic relations with Serbia. And uh, at that point, and they only reestablished them a few years later. Mm -hmm. So this period is also uh, important, like for various reasons, for our story here. One is the, those army officers who, uh, you know, made this conspiracy and killed the king. The other thing is that a year previous to that one, in 1902, another group connected to the Serbian military and militarism in general was organized um this is a, a group that is mentioned under various names uh, you, sometimes the macedonian committee sometimes the serbian committee sometimes the central committee or something like this mm -hmm. so this was founded in 1902 supposedly is some kind of a private initiative um but soon especially after the, this switch of the regime it becomes a part of the state under the name the serbian defense Mm -hmm. um, this is a secret militaristic, also intelligence organization attached to the state uh, that is really what they are doing is they're organizing an intelligence network and a kind of a paramilitary guerrilla movement and in specifically in Macedonia and in Kosovo, but more in Macedonia. These, these are the regions that are still um, uh, occup officially a part of the Turkish state and as such recognized by everyone, including the Serbian state. Mm -hmm, so right. Serbia then covertly through this organization, which is a secret group, organizes this intelligence and guerrilla activity in these areas, which it considers like its own, uh, although not officially, and wants, like they, they can see in the future, you know, they see that the Tur uh, Turkish state is probably near its end, and uh, they want to secure that area for the Serbian nationalist cause. They're calling uh, dibs. Yes. <laughs> um, so what they do, they organize the Chetnik movement. This is for the first time when we have such a thing, and this is or, the, the movement is organized, or the Chetnik guerrilla is all organized by this Serbian defense secret committee, uh, kind of para-state or deep state part of the Serbian state, let's say. Um, uh, the, the Chetniks were, I think, inspired really by the, the Macedonian nationalists and the Bulgarian nationalists at the time who were doing a similar thing uh, uh -huh. to that one and had their own guerrillas in the area. The, the area was full, full of different guerrillas. So you would have like this kind of Macedonian-Bulgarian guerrillas, Greek guerrillas, Albanian, even some Turkish. And there, it was like a time of lots of violence and assassinations, political assassinations, clashes with the Turkish army in that area, and so on. So Serbia wanted to be a part of that, in some sense. And it was pretty a small, compared to how much, you know, other states and organizations like IMRO, or the, you know, Internal Macedonian Revolutionary Organization, how much fighters and detachments they had, the Serbs were kind of a, a pretty small compared. But still, mm -hmm. they wanted to be a part of that action. Um, so in 1906, now the the tensions you know between Serbia and Austro-Hungary on the, are on the rise because it is clear that the new dynasty and the people kind of surrounded it and the political parties are not very keen for this alliance with 
uh, Austro-Hungary, and they're trying to develop other economical relationships with other powers. This is not popular in uh, Austro-Hungary. They don't like it. So they put, they use their economic power to put some pressure on the Serbian state. And they, for example, are lobbying that the Austro-Hungarian company Škoda should be the one who will supply the Serbian army with new cannons and equipment and so on. Mm -hmm. Even like the members of the royal family, like Franz Ferdinand, are lobbying for this and putting some pressure. But nevertheless, the, the Serbian state resists this and they don't, don't, they don't agree. They make some kind of an agreement with uh, French companies and banks. Right. Yeah. Um, also, Hungary doesn't like this. So they impose a kind of an economical embargo on Serbia. This is in, in 1906. Ah, mm -hmm. the pig war. This is the yeah, so-called pig, pig war. war. Or, or the customs war, which is not a war, it's like, like an embargo. Yeah. That, that lasts from 1906. But pig war sounds the best. I mean, come on. Pig war sounds yes. great. Yes, definitely. It, it is a very disappointing, though, Wikipedia article to read, considering the time. You find out it's not about police or. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So the pig war is called the pig war because the pigs were the main or almost the only Serbian export. So. That's where the name comes from. It lasts until 1911, uh, but it, it kind of backfired for Austro-Hungary because this actually um, expedited Serbian uh, economical relations with other states, mm. and so they really developed a good economical relationship with you know France and um, Egypt, uh, also Germany, and uh, I think the UK. Um, so the really the the you know the history was pushed in the opposite way that uh, was the intention of Austro-Hungary. So the uh, also the situation in Bosnia is not helping this relationship. So Bosnia officially under international law or agreements between states is a part of Turkey, but since the Berlin Agreement of 1878, it is de facto controlled by Austria. They control Bosnia, although officially it's not a part of their state. So in 1908, the Austro-Hungarian government decides to, you know, they, it was enough of this bullshit. We're mm -hmm. just going to officially annex Bosnia and make it officially a part of our state. Right. Which was, you know, illegal according to the international laws, <laughs> the powers and states saw it at that time. Meh. International yeah. law. Yeah. I mean, what, what it is. So, but it made, you know, it made like, you know, like when the Serbs killed the king, no one liked that. So no one liked yep. this as well, because, mm. you know, it was like not according to what they agreed some 30 years uh, before that. Mm -hmm. um, and Serbia was especially pissed because, you know, Serbian nationalists and Serbian government to some degree, they also, like Macedonia and Kosovo that you mentioned previously, also thought of Bosnia as a kind of historical Serbian land or like, um, or a, a land very close to it, they, they saw in some future Serbian or South Slavic state that they wanted to create. Although they couldn't really officially say that they wanted to create it because, you know, Austro-Hungary wouldn't like that. Right. Mm. Um, so in 1908, uh, this uh, annexation triggers a political crisis in Serbia. Uh, the society is getting mobilized. Um, and so the, the organization that we mentioned before, the Serbian Defense, now becomes uh, an organization, like uh, up to that point, it was a covert secret organization, and now it has its public face and it renames itself um, National Defense, Narod mm Neodbrana. -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is the organization really that becomes like a mass organization in 1908, and it mobilizes society for this nationalist cause of basically preparation uh, for a war against Austro Hungary because of this Bosnia uh, issue. Um, so they're doing that, but at some point, uh, the Serbian government sees that this is like not really in the Serbian interest. So they, especially when other powers uh, show that they, they wanted to ha have some kind of a compromise with Austro-Hungary on this issue and to actually uh, recognize uh, Bosnia as a part of Austro-Hungary, Serbia as well really kind of slowed down and went into that direction of having some kind of a compromise with the Austrian government, mm -hmm. which greatly disappointed the hardcore nationalists in Serbia. Uh, and they, some of them saw this as a kind of treason. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this move 
uh, by the Serbian government triggered the next process, which was the creation of the another a new secret organization, a, a new military secret group called the Unification or Death, better known as the Black Hand, um, which was officially formed in 1910, 1911, but probably existed in some informal sense before that. Uh, the group was organized partially by some of the officers who were a part of the conspiracy in 1903 to kill the king. Mm -hmm. uh, not all of them, uh, mostly the younger uh, members of that conspiracy, uh, especially this guy called Colonel Apis, who was yeah. seen as a kind of a char charismatic leader uh, of the Black Hand and who was quite of a, a like a nationalist fanatic, uh, and then his right hand man uh, Tankosic, Voya Tankosic, who was seen as a maniac and also like yes. even people who were like uh, served under him were like in some memoirs that, that I read said that he was pretty dumb uh, mm -hmm. and, and very crazy. Um, so they they organized this group, um, which is a secret group. Uh, it has also civilians involved in it, uh, like this guy called Chupa, who is a journalist, a former leader of the student movement in Serbia, and who is greatly inspired by the history of European 19th century secret nationalist organizations like the Carbonari, uh, yeah. but also the Freemasonry and so on. So Chupa is the guy who is very much into like, you know, rituals and the stuff that you think of when you think of, you know, European secret groups of the 19th century. Right. Um, so they, the you know, the Black Hand actually has all of this. They have the secret, like the, you know, the, the ritual where, where you, you know, make an oath that you will not betray the organization and the punishment for betraying it is that mm -hmm. and you have daggers and guns and like bottles of poison and people in black uh, cloaks and you know also kind of also uh, pretty similar to you know some rituals that uh, the, the, mo the American mob has like the yeah or mm -hmm. the Cosa Nostra which, which is not surprising because also they have a similar origin uh, some of these, uh, uh, of course, rituals were also came out of the Carbonari mm -hmm. and this this kind of nationalist paramasonic organization of the 19th century. People so really like their dress up back in the day, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sounds well, also it, a bit yeah. like the Black Legion or the Order. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, any yeah. secret society. But I think people just had fun, you know, getting yeah. their little costumes together and. Yeah, you also want to in, in, with the triple their poison. <laughs> yeah, you also want to intimidate the new member, you know. Like you uh -huh. want to make to make it super serious and to have all of these things there and to well, talk that about that guy's got death. a lot of poison. Yeah, you know, to talk about death and betrayal, you know, like uh -huh, like when uh -huh. when Christopher Moltisanti became a, a member of the mob in the Sopranos. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's kind of similar to that, you know. He was super scared of that especially that bird that appeared on the window. Uh, it had an effect on him, the whole ritual. So I think that's the idea. You want to scare we're, the person. We're all yeah. agreed that any future members of the show need to go through something similar, right? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. brutal okay. hazing. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, great. We'll we'll have, we have some rituals so. that yeah. will you know, combine from all the things, different mm -hmm. initiation rites that we've talked about. Exactly. And you have to name each one to, yeah. to get in. Yes. Yeah, I like it. Um, so Waterboard the interns. <laughs> So these people who organize the the Black Hand, they're also Chetniks and kind of leaders of the, the Chetnik guerrilla. So Vojvod the Tankosic, uh, you know, the right hand man to, to Apis, is one of the main organizers of training camps for Chetniks and mm -hmm. so on. Um, they are also members of the National Defense, and although they were disappointed uh, how the organization, you know, mainly followed the lead of the government. Uh, they still retain positions of power in that organization. So, like, uh, a member of the Black Hand is the general secretary of the National Defense. And remember, the National Defense is not only, like, a political group, it's also a network, an intelligence network mm -hmm. that operated mostly in Macedonia. But from 1908 and this annexation crisis in Bosnia, they are also focusing, uh, to a great degree, on Bosnia as well. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, a more dangerous thing to do because Austro-Hungary, although we now know, was also close to its end. It didn't seem so uh, in 1908. It was much right. less obvious 
you know, it was a much more uh, powerful state than the Turkey was. So, and it was a dangerous thing to try to do something like that on their territory, but they did do it, and they had a network like similar to the one they had in Macedonia, they had in Bosnia. Although they didn't at that point, they didn't have like an actual guerrilla there. It was more like intelligence network. But volunteers from Bosnia use these national defense channels to go to Serbia and then join Chetniks in Serbia and then go fight in Macedonia. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. With an idea that maybe eventually they will do that in Bosnia as well. And this is uh, under Apis's rule, uh, yeah? As yeah. he's like this gray eminence politically as well and well yes, connected. Ap- yes, exactly. Apis doesn't have... Uh, in the early years, he really doesn't have any position in the state, but he is, as you said, a gray eminence, and he controls through this organization a lot of, you know, the military because many important officers in the military are members of the Black Hand. But at some point, he, uh, I think, during the Balkan Wars, which happened in 1912 and 1913, uh, he becomes also officially the head of military intelligence. Mm. So um, he wasn't just taken up his. Ah, no. Uh, oh. No. <laughs> You got yeah. all the puns today. <laughs> I do have all the puns. <laughs> You're on it. Um, so, in, you know, during the Balkan Wars in 1912-1913, uh, Serbia expands territorially, and Kosovo and, and Macedonia actually become a part of Serbia. And they are, uh, in these early uh, years, treated as an occupied territory, and so the, the military really has a rule there more than any civilian um, apparatus in those Mm -hmm. new uh, conquered areas. And there is actually a conflict between the Black Hand and the state over this. Although not, you know, the Black Hand is a covert secret organization, so it's not officially a conflict between them, but between some army officers and the government because the military refuses in those areas to have um, civilian... Uh, like apparatus uh, imposed over them. They don't mm-hmm. recognize mm-hmm. basically civilian rule. Uh, so you already see that, it, it, you know, the, the Serbian state has like a few sides to it, at least. Like, there uh-huh. is, you know, there is like the, the, the Pashic government, the, that's the prime minister, uh, the leader of the radical party, who is quite powerful, but then there are these people who really don't like him, who are from the military and who are from this kind of militaristic deep state that has Chetniks at their disposal and, like, this secret organization and so on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, in Bosnia at the time, there are also groups of young, enthusiastic uh, nationalist revolutionaries who are very young, usually, like, high school students, and then they become university students, who are usually now called Young Bosnia, although at the time n- no such organization existed. It was more kind of a milieu a kind of a subculture of nationalist revolutionaries interested, you know, in also socialist anarchist ideas, but were firmly really on the nationalist side. So some of these people, uh, you know, are recruited by the national defense. Uh, many of them, because of their activities, are expelled from schools mm-hmm. in, in Bosnia. And then they, through national defense uh, channels, they go to Serbia, they continue uh, their schools there, but also are recruited by Tankosic to go to, the ones who are able to, they go to these Chetnik training camps and are recruited to uh, recruited to Chetnik d- detachments, and then some of them fight in the Balkan Wars as Chetniks and in the First World War. Mm-hmm. There was uh, some of these young Bosnian people, the most famous ones, like Gavrilo Princip, were not deemed capable of being Chetniks by uh, Tankusic, but they, uh, most likely how it went is that they saw them as potential good, you know, uh, assassinators, mm-hmm. especially because some of them were quite, like, not in uh, great shape. They had tuberculosis and so on. And right. Tankusic being a kind of an apis, cruel people that they were, they were thinking, okay, these kids are kind of weak and, you know, they will probably die soon, so we might just as well sacrifice them in uh, doing this assassination. Uh, right. I mean, young Bosnian people had their own motivation to do so. Like, they definitely wanted to king Franz Ferdinand independent of uh, the Black Hand, but what the Black Hand, you know, provided was training and military equipment and bombs and guns and and channels, uh, intelligence channels that they can could control like the national defense one for them to use right uh, so 
you know, there there was this question how much was um, the Serbian state behind uh, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand in 1914 in Sarajevo. Uh, in the Yugoslav historians had a, like a consensus that it was not, that this was really uh, mostly the idea of the Black Hand and of the young Bosnia people. And uh, I think this um, is the most likely uh, uh, what happened there because, you know, as I described, this deep state, uh, the Black Hand, they had some control over these channels, which were created by the state, mm -hmm. but the Black Hand became almost a kind of a secret parallel center uh, mm -hmm. uh, to using some of these channels, like the national defense. And they could like almost like kind of tap into these channels or like almost hack the channels created by the Serbian state for their own use. Mm -hmm. So, because, you know, they, they, they were a part of it, but they had their own center and made their own policy and, and decisions, independent of the government in Belgrade. Um, so they sent this Gabriel Princip and his group through the national defense channels um, back to Bosnia with guns. And some of these agents of national defense who met these boys on the Bosnian side were kind of suspicious what's going on. Some young people with guns, bombs, and so on going in, but they wouldn't like ask questions or something like this because this was not the protocol. How do you you do things when someone with the right codes comes and says the right things and so on? You provide them what they need, mm -hmm. but some of them were suspicious of it, so they contacted their like superiors in the organization, and uh, soon enough, the word this word like reached the government in Belgrade and the Prime Minister Pasic about these young guys, you know. Uh, suspiciously uh, walking from S Serbia to Bosnia with guns and so on. So the it, there is indications that the government in Serbia tried to stop them somehow, mm -hmm. uh, but it was too late and they actually killed Franz Ferdinand um, in the June of uh, 1914. Uh, Barely, but they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, almost were uh, almost a failure, but they did kill him. Um, there is also a, an idea that the Black Hand kind of didn't believe that these people would kill him. Mm -hmm. Because when you think of it, it sounds like not very likely. Right. And that their, their kind of idea was for them to fail, but that this will be some kind of an embarrassment for the Serbian government, and which is, you know, the Black Hand saw as their enemy and also considered maybe killing the prime minister and and the new king or, uh, or prince regent and so on. So... The, they would cause some embarrassment for the government, who they saw as not friendly to their cause. Right. But anyway, they were successful. And the First World War started. And after the war, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia was formed. Uh, but during the war, um, uh, Black Hand still existed. The, the Serbian state was kind of the whole apparatus was exiled and went uh, to Greece or through Albania and was stationed in uh, Thessaloniki. And at that point... The, the Serbian state and the king and prince region decided the Black Hand is a big problem for them. So in 1916, while in, in Greece, you know, the exile government organized a court case against the Black Hand, and which resulted in Apis being sentenced to death mm -hmm. uh, and killed. The, the, the accusation was that he was preparing the assassination of Prince Regent Alexander, the future king of Yugoslavia. Uh, but uh, he's also... Uh, you know, the idea is that they were trying to somehow please the Austro-Hungarians, uh, that right. they did not like that these people killed, killed Franz Ferdinand, and they wanted to make some kind of a peace agreement with Austro-Hungary, yeah. and uh, that they wanted to get rid of these people who uh, who killed Franz Ferdinand. Right. Yeah. I mean... So it was yeah. not a public... It, it wasn't... Uh, how do you say this? It was like a, a known secret, I yeah. guess, yeah. Uh, right. for these negotiations. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, so um, now Yugoslavia is formed, and uh, yay, yay! Um, soon Alexander becomes the king, and there is a new kind of ideology, uh, the ideology of a Yugoslav nation. So Serbs and Croats and Slovenes are all Yugoslavs, parts of this nation. New organizations are formed that uh, propagate this idea of a single. Uh, Yugoslav nation uh, organizations that we talked about like Oryuna which is like a proto-fascist organization right? Um, Chetnik organizations survive, they exist as kind of paramilitary 
the third patriotic nationalist, also kind of, I would say, fascist uh, groups uh, that, you know, do parades and beat up, uh, beat up uh, communists and workers and so on. Mm -hmm. um, national defense still exists. Uh, it's not so important anymore. It ad adopts this kind of Yugoslav integralist idea and is close to groups like Oryuna and the Chetniks and so on. Um, now, in the late 30s, of course, you know, it's the rise of the Third Reich. Uh, now Ger Nazi Germany becomes a, a European superpower, and the Yugoslav um, government, you know, becomes in the late 30s a kind of a pro-German government, at least for pragmatic reasons. They want to have good relations with the Third Reich. Um, this culminates in 1941 when they signed the tripartite uh, agreement with uh, Germany um, and Italy and Japan. Uh, but before that, uh, there were groups of people, especially in the military, especially in the Air Force, but also politicians who didn't like this. So like in 1903, uh, secret organizations and groups, especially in the military, start to form against this government policy. And w one of the leaders of these circles was a guy called Slobodan Jovanovic, who was a university professor and uh, a friend and supporter of the late Apis. Um, and uh, now he's the leader of a, like a public political kind of think tank that exists, which is called the Serbian Cultural Club, but also of a secret group, which is inspired by the Black Hand and has former Black Hand members in it, which calls itself Conspiracia or mm -hmm. Conspiracy. Yes. Yeah, so, greatest name for a secret yes. organization ever. <laughs> so this group led by Slobodan Jovanovic and other Black Hand, ex-Black Hand members, many of them military, um, in 1938 organizes this covert group that uses the infrastructure of the officially existing group, the Serbian Cultural Club, to organize, and they start working on a coup to change the government uh, and to have a pro kind of Western government, like, uh, and also pro-Soviet. So they want to renew these relationships the, uh, the, which they had with their allies in the First World War. On the mm -hmm. one hand, they're fine with, although they're mostly anti-communist, not all of them, but mostly are, they're fine in establishing good relations with the Soviet Union, but also and primarily with France and United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, so up to this point, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia doesn't have any uh, diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union at all. But this group is working on it. Uh, so in 1941, uh, after the government signed this tripartite agreement, there are big demonstrations against it, and there is a coup. And so some military officers from the Air Force, like Dusan Simovic, they form a new government. Um, and quickly they try uh, to prevent Nazi invasion by going to the Soviet Union and signing some kind of an, a friendship agreement with them and establishing uh, diplomatic relations. Mm -hmm. So this is something now where different people with different political ideologies work together on. Mm -hmm. So you have, for example, Milan Gavrilovic, who is an ex-member of the Black Hand, a politician very close to Slobodan Jovanovic, like his disciple or something like this. He becomes the first ambassador in the Soviet Union after these events. Mm -hmm. um, but then you also have people who are involved in some of these activities, like Bojin Simic and Mustafa Golubic, yeah. who are both of them uh, ex-members of the Black Hand, and also like Milan Gavrilovic, all three of them were Chetniks, uh, you know, in the Balkan Wars um, and so on. But this Bojin Simic and Mustafa Golubic, unlike Milan Gavrilovic and Slobodan Ivanovic, are like of pro-Soviet orientation. And Mustafa Golovic is even like a communist. Right. Mm -hmm. He's a member of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia. You know, we have a whole whole episode about him. Yeah, he's uh, a legend. So Mustafa Golovic is, you know, the person who does things during the Balkan Wars and later the First Balkan War for Apis and the Black Hand. Like during the Balkan Wars, like um, uh, he sent to uh, France by Apis to meet an uh, important member of the Black Hand and the young Bosnia and basically instructs him that what they need to do is organize the assassination of Franz Ferdinand and then they, this is like according to the notes that Mustafa Golovic wrote himself, like some 
two decades later when he wrote this for the Comintern about you know his activities in the past uh, while in Moscow. And, you know, he basically describes how he was the organizer of the Franz Ferdinand assassination, how they contacted Gavrilo Princip and the others, instructed them in what they need to do, and so on. Um, later on, you know, the First World War uh, is already going on, and uh, Golubic is with the Serbian military in Greece, you know, with the exiled government, and Apis gives him a new task to go again to France to meet that same guy. And the, or maybe to Switzerland, and this time, you know, Golubic does this and says to this guy, "Okay, now we ha- now we need to assassinate the king of Greece, the king of Romania, yeah. uh, the mm-hmm. German um, uh, emperor, and so on." But the guy is like go. this guy, the Gacinovic, the other guy is this time is like not he doesn't want to c- c- do this stuff anymore. Like you know, it's a whole chaos of First World War. Regicide is so passe for him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Also, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Gacinovich at the time was kind of a more, he was a member of the Russian Social Revolutionary Party. He Mm -hmm. had some other ideas in mind. He became a friend of Trotsky as well and so on. So he refuses. uh, Golubich goes back um, and says that they were also at that time um, uh, planning to kill Prince Regent Alexander of Yugoslavia and also Nikola Pashic, the prime minister. So he actually confirms that you know, that they were planning to kill uh, Alexander, which is what they were tried um, during the First World War in 1916. Mm. Yeah, right. Um, and so on. And uh, But is then, conveniently for himself, given a new task by um, uh, uh, Apis to go to Russia with Bojin Simic and to recruit... Um, uh, Yugoslavs and Serbs who fought in the Austro-Hungarian army against Russia and then were captured there by Russians and to recruit them to make a, some kind of a Serbian detachment uh, who, that would came, come back to Serbia and fight against Austro-Hungary there, which he does with Bojin Simic. Um, after that, uh, you know, Mustafa Golovic goes his own way. Bojin Simic stays in Russia until the process against the Black Hand starts in Thessaloniki. So he decides not to go back because he was sentenced, you know, in absentia there for being a part of the Black Hand. And Bojit Simic joins the Russian army, becomes a colonel there. According to some, switches to uh, the Red Army. Uh, but this is maybe not completely certain, but definitely becomes a, some kind of a pro-Soviet agent at that point. And comes back to Yugoslavia late, much later on, I think in the 30s, uh, as a pro-Soviet person like officially he's not a communist he Bojin Simic is even a part of these uh think tanks organized by Slobodan Jovanovic like the Serbian Cultural Club and so on he joins their meetings gives lectures and so on mm-hmm. but he is very much uh into Yugoslavia having good relationship with the Soviet Union and becoming allies with them so when the they do the coup in 41 they re-establish relations with uh, the Soviet Union, but nevertheless, this doesn't stop Nazis from invading Yugoslavia on the 6th of April in 41, which is basically the end of the monarchist Yugoslavia. The, the, the state is completely occupied by different occupying uh, nations, mostly by Germans and Italy and Bulgaria and so on. Puppet, Nazi puppet states are established. Uh, you know, as we talked about the independent state of Croatia. Uh, Many times. Uh, as, yes. And so on. So it's a pretty, like, a bad situation. Um, so Bojin Simic, who is, you know, um, this pro-Soviet guy, he joins the the new exiled monarchist government. Um, and so the, the first exiled government is the same one which was formed, you know, when the coup happened. And the president mm-hmm. was Dusan Simovic. And Slobodan Jovanovic, the leader of the secret group and also of the Serbian Cultural Club, became the, the vice president of that government. So they are exiled in London and they are officially recognized, you know, as a part of the Allied forces, although they are in exile once right. again. So, you know, in the beginning we had an exile government in the First World War, which was in Greece. Now we have an exile government in 41, which is in London. Uh, and, you know, black hand people have something to do with both these uh, events. Um, so Borjin Simic, you know, works inside of this government 
Although he wants good relations with the Soviet Union, so for example, he is tasked by the new government to be a be, uh, kind of a diplomatic envoy in the De Gaulle movement, uh, which he does, and he he lobbies uh, uh, so that De Gaulle gives this the Legion of Honor to Dražen Mihailović, the leader of the Chetniks or the uh-huh. Royalist guerrilla um, in Yugoslavia, which is officially the state, still officially the state army of Yugoslavia, are these new Chetniks led by Draža Mihailović. Right. Uh, but, you know, soon enough, uh, he switches, uh, like, he, his opinion changes and he becomes a more openly, like, pro-partisan, the other resistance movement led by Tito, which is probably because he followed the lead of the Soviet state, you know, because the Soviet state themselves in the beginning supported the Traja is the leader of the resistance, and then later, only later on changed and supported Tito, right. and I think Bo- Boj and Simic really followed that lead. So, you know, we have this uh, interesting situation where you have black hand people, some of which maintain to a greater degree their old kind of right-wing Serbian nationalist ideology, and then you have these others like Boj and Simic and Mustafa Golubic who are pro-communist or communist. You know, there are right. some others uh, uh, from the Black Hand who are of this opinion as well. But up to 41, you know, especially in 41, they are on the, for various and different reasons, they are on the same side, supporting this coup and everything. But things change. And, um, you know, especially when allies recognize the partisans and kind of ditch Draja and his Chetniks because they collaborated uh, with the Nazis and were not an effective resistance group. There are differences, you know, be- between these former black hand comrades. They go uh, on in different directions. So Bojin Simic, you know, he goes back to Yugoslavia now the so- after the Second World War, the socialist Yugoslavia, and becomes Tito's ambassador to Turkey, for example. Mm-hmm. And even in 1953, there is a new trial uh, in Yugoslavia which rehabilitates Apis and his black hand comrades for what they were sentenced in 1916 during the First World War. And so the socialist state makes a point to say how Apis was innocent for some mm-hmm. reason, you know, uh-huh. which is interesting. Yeah. Well, so this is 1953, but, you know, we know that other things happened in 1953. You know, while does the state, the new Yugoslav socialist state, is rehabilitating Apis in 1953, Young Nikola Kava is trying to escape Yugoslavia. You know. Yeah. All right. So we have the foundations of the of Yugoslavia, mm-hmm. of the the Serbian deep state, mm-hmm. uh, working behind the scenes to probably kill Franz Ferdinand, mm-hmm. uh, as well as create international guerrilla connections and intelligence connections with a surprising diversity of great powers between France and the Soviet Union. And uh, yeah, that's where we are, huh? Yeah, we, we went from the First World War to the Second World War. Uh-huh. Um, Which we've done on this show uh, a yeah. few times. Uh, pretty so. frequently, pretty <laughs> yeah. frequently. I mean, yeah. Um, but so we, w- when we talk, now we're going to switch to the post-Second World War period and to the Cold War. Um, when the fun begins yeah but so we talked about this period you know about this serbian anti-communist terrorist group called sopo which one might say is the new black hand for the reasons i will explain uh we talked about this through two characters mainly which were father stoiko kajevic and nikola kavaya and I mentioned now, you know, 1953, the year when the Titoist Yugoslavia decided to rehabilitate Apis, is the same year when Nikola Kavaya, one of these future anti-communist terrorists, decided to uh, try to escape this Titoist Yugoslavia and go to the West. He failed, by the way, um, but uh, at that time. Uh, but before I go into Kavaya and his frenemy, Father Kajevic, I just <laughs> want to mention that like, when these new young emigres uh, you know, went out of Yugoslavia in the 50s and 60s, there was already a network for them to join there. Right. Um, yeah. And we talked about this before. So the national defense, you know, the group that started as the Macedonian or Serbian or the secret committee in 1902 that organized the Chetniks, uh, then became the Serbian defense as a covert 
parastate organization, guerrilla intelligence. Then in 1908, got its public face as the national defense, um, survived uh, in America. Uh, it was all, We mentioned that it was, from the time of the First World War, already existing in America under the name Serbian National Defense. Right. Uh, first president of it in the United States was Mihailo Pupin, right. um, the physicist who was you know, also one of the founders of NASA, uh, and so on. But during the Second World War, the, the Serbian National Defense in America is sort of reorganized and rejuvenated by a guy who comes to America, a Serbian guy who comes to America in 1941 called Jovan Ducic, who is a well-known like, Serbian poet, kind of extreme Serbian nationalist, and a diplomat. Right. Before he went to America, he was a Yugoslav ambassador uh, to uh, Franco East Spain. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and people said that he was a supporter of Franco and called him yeah, like a I Serbian mean, phalangist and so on. Yeah, I mean, he had to leave Spain because Spain recognized independent state of Croatia and, oh, and, not, yeah. and not the Yugoslav exiled government. And he came to the U.S. And that's, yeah, as as you said, Ray, that's who yeah. uh, all the communists in America called um, the phalangists. Phalangist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, her, for sure, he was like a Serbian chauvinist, very anti-Yugoslav, you know, saw Yugoslavia as a kind of a Croatian conspiracy against the Serbian nation and so on. So he went to the States, I think specifically to Gary, Indiana, I think, yeah, yeah. where his cousin lived, who was like a wealthy industrialist. So these two guys, uh, you know, also met with Bishop Dionysius of the Serbian Orthodox Church, a very anti-communist bishop that we talked about a lot. Yep. Um, and they kind of rejuvenated, restarted the Serbian national defense in America. Um on the basis of this extreme kind of Serbian nationalist ideology, which was also very anti-Yugoslav. Like, not all of the Chetniks and exiled, you know, supporters of the previous regime were that anti-Yugoslav from the Serbian side. Yeah, but these like, guys definitely were. Th they were, yeah. yeah. Um, so, it's interesting that, you know, this Serbian national defense in America, in its own history that they, we read, uh, uh, they also describe this episode as like uh, the, the the one that I'm gonna now recount as like a, an important episode in their like uh, organization. And this is like that when uh, during the, the the immediate period after the end of the Second World War, a lot of Chetniks, um, you know, members of the Draža Mihailović guerrilla movement, were exiled in Europe, specifically in Germany. And they were populated by uh, allies in a, an abandoned little German town. It was abandoned because most of the population was like kicked out of it by Americans because they were like the, the town was kind of an SS stronghold. So to punish mm. the the population, they were kicked out of the town, and the town was populated by these Serbs. So mm. they they made their own little Serbian community there. So for example. Even like an important ideologue of the Serbian cause, like Slobodan Drashkovic, also lived there. Right. So Slobodan Drashkovic, we talked about, he's the future member of the John Birch Society. Yeah. Uh, before that, he was in this secret group, Konspiracija, that I uh, mentioned from 1938. And his father, Milor Drashkovic, was a me probably a member of the Black Hand, assassinated by communists and so on. So lots of things connect uh, in this one person. Um, but what this history of Serbian national defense also mentions is that how people like these Chetniks from this town and others were recruited by the Allies, specifically by the British, into a new kind of a quasi-military service, which was called something I, ne I can never remember how it's called, some mixed mixed labor uh, service, yeah, yeah, mixed something labor like service, this, uh, again, uh, actually. Uh, which is also, they were also called the Watchmen. But uh, the other name that they uh, uh, used uh, was the blacks because they wore black uniforms. Mm. And, and they describe in this um, history how this was like a, a military type of training that they received and they were like basically controlled by the allies. They don't really say what they did, but they say that the training was pretty tough mm -hmm. uh, and they wore black uniforms. Um, and then they describe in this history how they were... Uh, through the channels of the Serbian national defense in America, but also to this, uh, Boris, what's the name of the CIA front group which 
uh, was used to settle migrants pol- oh. like, like, from Europe to America. Yeah. Talking about Bloodstone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But oh, the, the front group. No, oh, the, the specific the association name of, the group. of captive European nations. Nations. That thing. Yeah, yeah. No, there's uh, there something are a few like, actually. Uh, there is one that uh, sounds very kind of benign, like uh, something migration committee, oh, something, yeah. something. Yeah, I can't yeah, remember yeah. now. Yeah, it's oh. it's it's slipping because I'm also thinking of the the name of the directive that allowed it to be right uh, established, and so now it's all. Yeah, NCS I, I, fourteen or whatever, NCS yeah, fourteen, yeah. something like this. Oh, how yeah. do we know all that? But we don't know this fucking thing. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I'm, I can't remember now. But I think it was called like immigration service, something like that. It was very yeah, yeah, yeah. like you said. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yes, yeah. yes. So through this, through CIA basically uh, and Serbian National Defense, these people are channeled to America. And it's interesting that this is something that you know they they themselves say in their brief history. You know, yeah. we were settled there. We went through this training. We were in this paramilitary called the Blacks in black uniforms. And then through the channels of Serbian National Defense and the CIA front, they don't call it the CIA front, but it 100% is yeah, yeah, a CIA yeah, front. Definitely. They, were, they, they settled in the United States. I don't, so this is like what we concluded was probably a part of the Operation Bloodstone. I don't know, Fritz, if you want to say anything about that. Yes. So, uh, yeah, Bloodstone was set up at the end of the war to mostly to emigrate, to create these uh, European na- national representatives in exile, but also to sneak in war criminals into doing uh, either espionage work or hopefully and ideally for Bloodstone recruits uh, f- forming into sort of guerrilla units in Europe uh, per- to prepare for the Third World War. Um, and to be behind the lines when the bombs start to fall. And so there's a connection, for instance, between the Bloodstone recruitment activities and the foundation of the Green Berets, but also mm-hmm. a lot of Bloodstone recruits just ended up working for, like, whatever, Radio Free Europe, getting professorship positions in universities, or otherwise making these, like, exiled cultural groups that would form broader political anti-communist coalitions. So it was just a, a massive... A uh, two-year effort, I think, to to smuggle in as many fucking you know nationalist and Nazi and fascist lunatics as you could. Yeah, it sounds like some kind of a proto gladio situation there yeah. going on, and and these like Chetniks and members of the Serbian National Defense and the Serbian National Defense as such, I think, were a part of this effort or or cl- closely related to it. So. When these younger people like Nikola Kavaya and Father Ka- Kajevic came to America, they had this, or to the West, they had these channels and structures at their disposal. So, you know, Nikola Kavaya, born in 32, obviously didn't, you know, wasn't active during the Second World War, although he claimed drunk to a journalist that he, did, he killed one wounded oh, German right. soldier. German well he, or something, right? Yeah, threw him in a, uh, over the bridge, I think, while, while ah, he was dying. Yeah. Uh, but he was like, I don't know, 12 or 13 <laughs> yeah, years 13, old yeah. uh, when he killed this guy. He's a big so, guy. Yeah. So after the war, Kavaya becomes a pilot, you know, in the, the, the Titoist army. He's trained, uh, trained uh, to be one. And he's um, stationed in this military base in the town of Sombor. But, you know, his two brothers were communists. They were partisans. Uh, but you know, in '48, they said some wrong things, and they were so seen as pro-Stalinist, pro-Soviet. You know, and this was the uh, the era of the Tito-Stalin split, so that was a wrong thing to say. So they were sent to the basically the Goli Otok camp, which was mm-hmm. a pretty, I mean, horrible, rough um, concentration camp made for the communists who were seen as pro-Stalinist at the time. Uh, this, you know, had an effect on uh, Kavaya. He, it's not clear, was he an anti-communist at this period, or was he just an anti-Titoist, or what was going on? But as, you know, an officer uh, in the Yugoslav Air Force, he joined uh, at that period, uh, he was recruited for a secret anti-communist officer organization that he says was organized uh, s- some years previous to that, um, this this is like now the early fifties, by 
pre-war like officers of the royalist army who were now a part of the Titoist military and were anti-communists. So, and he was given various tasks by this organization, like to you know to write anti-communist graffiti, which he did, to uh, throw anti-communist flyers from his plane, which he did, to start a fire, you know, like a uh, like a a, a fuel reservoir which created a big explosion which he did then he was also supposed to steal some documents from the base he did that as well the only thing that he didn't do is assassinate the commander of the uh, ba- uh, the this base uh, which he was supposed to do and try to do but the the commander never showed up uh, where he was supposed to so he didn't do that they're really scaling him up you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. here right fuck Tito on the wall next like kill a man Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, shortly after that, the, the this secret anti-communist group was discovered, and many of them were arrested. Kavaya was not arrested, but he decided it's just a, a matter of time when he w- will be arrested. So him and his friend Sueto deserted from the military and were on this journey that where they tried to, you know, cross into Austria, basically going through a good part of Yugoslavia on foot and bicycles and having many horrible adventures and uh, escaping arrest and kidnapping people and taking prisoners and uh, so on. And in, after uh, quite an ordeal, they reached the, the, the Austrian border and there was like a small battle there because they, they you know, encountered uh, Yugoslav border guards there and Kavaya threw bombs at them and they were shooting and so on and they actually killed like three border guards yeah. uh, so after that uh, Kavaya was arrested and there was like a period where he was mostly transferred to different prisoners uh, prisons and like dungeons across Yugoslavia operated by the military or the state security and he was beaten mostly in the head like uh, quite <laughs> yes. a few times and we kind of concluded that you know, head trauma is a big part of his story because oh, definitely. Yeah, he, he was beaten unconscious many times. So in the end, he was sentenced. He got 18 years of prison. And in prison, he met a new friend, which was a Slovenian guy he liked uh, called Victor, and he served prison in Slovenia. So at, after four years of serving uh, this sentence, uh, both Victor and him were supposed to be transferred to this Goliotok camp that I mentioned, the notorious one. So they figure out, okay, this is their chance to escape now when they were transferred because they will not survive their imprisonment in Goliotok, is what they concluded. So while being transferred, while well, they were still in Slovenia, they jumped out of, they uh, like beat up some guards. They managed to do it very quickly in a train that we used to transfer them. They jumped out of the window and they reached because they were close to the Austrian border. And Victor, his friend, was from Slovenia. Then he knew the terrain and had also relatives in Austria. They reached Austria this time successfully. Uh, like this, so this was the end of uh, like fifties, I think, wh- when he did that. So <clears throat> Kavaya soon reaches Austria, uh, Salzburg, to be uh, precise. And yep. there, you know, he's in one of these internment camps for. Yugoslav immigrants, there, there's many of them who are still there, like Chetniks, who are still there from the end of the Second World War. And he is recru- recruited there by, uh, there by a guy called, he, he calls Colonel Shicha, who is, Shicha is a Chetnik uh, uh, colonel, but he's also a member of the Serbian National Defense. And he recruits Kavaya at the same time for the Serbian National Defense and to work for Western intelligence, mainly the CIA. So Shicha, was he, um, I forget if we covered this in, in the Kavai episodes, was he in the U.S. before? Was he sent back to recruit people? Because if he had been a defense, Serbian National Defense member, I'd assume he probably uh, spent it's some not, time it, in the U.S. It's not mentioned, but uh, uh-huh. Serbian National Defense also exists in Europe, I think, at this point. Uh-huh. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, because they're yeah. also in London. And yeah, yeah. France. they had like, yeah, yeah. because uh, he was like the president of the Serbian National Defense for Austria or something like this. Yeah, yeah um, no, I was just wondering, because there are yeah. these guys who went um, back, they went to the U.S. and then, mm. you know, kind of established contacts with the intelligence communities and with their respective organizations. And then yeah, we yeah, sent yeah. back to Europe to do recruitment. I was just wondering if you knew. If that was I the don't case. know. Kavai doesn't mention this. No. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he recruits him to work for the CIA. 
uh, and you know, so the, basically being recruited for the Serbian national defense was the same thing as being recruited for the CIA. He also does, does some like kind of low level terrorism for them. Like he burns some like Yugoslav tourist buses in Salzburg right. who came from yeah. the, the, the Mozart festival. Yes. And, and beats up some people who think are, he thinks are like communists, uh, yeah. and steals from them and so on. Um, I do. I do just imagine Kovaya looking like somebody just looks at him strangely. He's like, "That guy's a fucking communist." I knew it. You know, like Absolutely. just like, gets yeah. thrown into yeah. a complete psychotic rage and beats the shit out of some random passerby who looked at him weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, so um, after some years, he like because he now through through these like networks, he's not only a part of these Serbian anti-communist networks. He's a part of these like European and Eastern European fascist anti-communist network so he describes right. how with chicha and other like serbian officers who all work for western intelligence he he attends these meetings of anti-communists so he meets like stepan bandera in one of these meetings right and is at first kind of surprised to see him uh later on he would be accused by the ukrainians of trying to assassinate stepan bandera because the people who assassinated him were some polish people that were like kavaya's friends Mm. And Ka- and Kawaya was me- making some unwise comments on these meetings with Bandera, like you know, yeah. how come these po- Polacks don't kill uh, Stepan yes. Bandera? Like he-, he killed so many Polish people, why don't they do it? And so on. So yeah. people right. heard that, and when you know he was assassinated, people were thinking that he was a part of that. So he had to leave Austria and, or or Europe, really. And so eventually he would through. Uh, through the channels, you know, of Serbian national defense and also CIA, obviously, uh, he would settle in America. So he he says that you know he worked for CIA uh, different things. He doesn't go into like for the stuff that he did with you know Sopo and for the Serbian cause. He goes into quite detail. He doesn't describe what he did for the CIA, but he was also. Hey, they made deal. A deal is a deal. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't want to get the CIA pissed off at you again. For you, know, you can run your mouth and say, "Oh, Sopo, we wore sombreros and tried to kill Tito in Mexico," but you, you try yeah. spilling some secrets, exactly. see what happens yes. to you. Exactly. Yes. So you know, he did like he he did some work for them in Northern Africa. Uh, he was also a part of. He says Foreign Legion doesn't really. Uh, I, we had some. Dilemmas. It's if it's maybe not the French Foreign Legion, but maybe the mm, Spanish the one. Spanish one, yeah. Uh, because he said that he did a lot of work together with like uh, Cuban anti-communists uh, who took refuge in Franco's Spain and then joined the Foreign Legion with him. So I was thinking that maybe it's the Spanish Foreign Legion. Uh, so he and had that would check out with like you know Spain's yeah. position at the time, Franco Spain's yeah, yeah. position on the time of you know hosting some of these well-known collaborators. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he also did uh, like some work in Latin America. I think specifically in Central America for the CIA. Later in this drunken interview, he mentions how he killed like a girl in Northern Africa. I think, or maybe right, right. Uh, 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 like that's like one thing that he on, on that occasion decided to like he did that for the CIA. He had to execute her, and this is like a thing that gave him some problems. Like one one of the things that he said, or maybe the the one that he regret regretted. Uh, he also talked about how he worked closely with the Cuban organizations, like anti-communist, basically CIA-funded uh, Cuban organizations in America. He mentions Omega-7, mm-hmm. uh, but we also had a dilemma, is it Omega-7 or maybe he means Alpha-66, because Omega-7, from what we managed to find on the internet, is a group from the 70s, and he is describing early 60s when he did stuff with them so he, but he also basic- has a lot of head injury and alcohol yes. swimming around up yeah. there yeah so you know he's describing the the, the period of like uh, the cuban missile crisis uh and the bay of pig uh, pigs invasion and such things how he was basically a part of this cuban paramilitary trained by the cia that was waiting uh just a call to invade cuba and were very disappointed where they didn't do it so this sounds more like Alpha 66, which is, you know, a Cuban group that also had a close collaboration with the Minutemen that we talked right. about. Right. So, you know, yeah. there is a possible Kavaya Minutemen connection there as well. Um, but in, you know, in the Serbian circles, 
Kalaya was, uh, you know, like connected with groups in New York and Chicago. And he, Kalaya was, you know, uh, an active member of the Serbian National Defense, attended like their congresses, tried to push some more extreme people in that organization and so on. And he mentions how, you know, in America, they already had some like paramilitary groups, one of which was called the Black Hand. Um, yeah. And he was a member of it. Hmm. Um, but this will later develop into Sopo. And this is connected closely to the, the other guy that we talked about, which is Father Stojko Kajevic, mm -hmm. who is an, a priest in the Serbian Orthodox Church, born in 37, still alive, I think last time I checked. Um, so Kajevic managed to you know, escape Yugoslavia, if you can call it that, escape, in 63. So 10 years later from you know, first Kavaya's attempt. And he basically just crossed the border. He took a train, reached the border, right. and crossed it illegally, but without much problems. <laughs> Father Kavic first spent some time in Trieste, where we, he had his weird encounters with a weird, weird Serbian guy called Vurdelja, who was the head of a, like this kind of church nationalist organization in Trieste, which was very wealthy, had uh, ocean liners, and was basically yeah. kind of a how he describes him is almost a kind of a mob boss or something like this, mm -hmm. but clearly connected with the Americans. Uh, like when that guy died, his widow got an apartment, which was a part of the U.S. military base in Padova, I think. So mm -hmm. clearly had mm -hmm. a, that connection with them. Uh, after that, Kajevic reached Paris, where he was supposed to meet a very enigmatic guy called Andra Loncharic, which he did. Andra Loncharic was a Chetnik himself who openly uh, said that he worked for MI6. And then after the war, he got a secret task to go back to Yugoslavia and try to organize a resistance against the Titoist regime. Did f did this failed. He was arrested, spent 15 years in prison in Titoist Yugoslavia, was let go at some point, went to Paris. And this is when Kajvic met him there. And I think in 64, they had a secret meeting in, a, in a, like a, an apartment of a wealthy Serbian guy who had the best apartment of all the Serbs, Kajvic tells us. <laughs> His next door neighbor was Brigitte Bardot. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So wow. they had a secret meeting there and they organized a secret organization, um, which they explicitly said will be modeled after the Black Hand, and they called it Kremchia for the time being, which is like a named after text written by Seyd Sava in the Middle Ages, and it's like instructions uh, on how a monk should behave or something like this. Mm -hmm. So they are named after this. Okay. And so Loncharic gives to Father K uh, uh, Kajevic uh, like a special task, and this is the this is now 60, 1964, I think, that he should go to America. This is where the future is. And he should recruit people there for their organization and also rename it to something yeah. cooler than Kremchia. Uh, is his task? <laughs> yes, he's like the, some of those. He's like some of those Serbian Americans. They can't do those whole clusters of consonants. Right, there. You're gonna put a <laughs> yeah. bunch, put some vowels put in there vowels for the guy there, from yeah. Gary, Indiana. You know, yeah. <laughs> so he he does that. He goes to America. He immediately when he goes there, he meets Bishop Dionysie, who's you know a big like basically one of the leaders of the Serbian National Defense and a guy who was very well acquainted with these uh, terrorist activities of Sopo and so on. And he gets, you know, blessings from him from the task that he's supposed to do. Um, so uh, he does that and he goes to America and he sort of recruits new people, but also recruits these people who already organized in groups, you know, like the one that Kalaya mentioned, like the Black Hand or something. So all, the, all these groups kind of unite in what is to become SOPO, I think in 66. So, mm. and Kajevic is sort of the, operational leader of SOPO. SOPO is short for the Serbian Liberation Move Movement Fatherland. And it, it is, again, explicitly said that SOPO is supposed to be a new black hand. So this is like not, um, not the only reason that maybe there is some sense of calling them the new black hand. The other thing is that they, like the original black hand, are basically a part of the same organization, the National Defense, later called right. the Serbian National Defense, mm -hmm. and re represent a more kind of extreme uh, super militant wing of that organization, like the Black Hand did originally. Right. Um, so 
they do bom- lots of bombing stuff. Like they they put bombs in uh, diplomatic like uh, offices of the Yugoslav state in America and in Canada on a few occasions. Uh, some of their members get killed because their bombs explode when they're trying to prepare them at their homes and so on. But the bombings is what they do. Um, and the favorite it, pastime of any group in in the seventies, honestly. Was, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The bombs had to come back then. So very early on, uh, their kind of founder and leader, this enigmatic commando who worked for MI6, Andra Loncheric, and lived in Paris, is killed by the Yugoslav state security. Uh, his head is split in two with an axe. Uh, yeah. We talked about this. This is kind of this is the Yugoslav response for to the foundation of uh, you know the, the SOPO, uh, which shocks them pretty much. Uh, but you know, still they want to do what they want to do. Uh, but yeah, you know, I mean, for sure it was a big shock for them. Um, later on, uh, there is another murder that shocks them. Uh, one of, in the seventies, uh, again one of their leaders, Dragi Shakashiko, which is brutally murdered. Like with stabbings and sixty stabbings, together with his like very young stepdaughter who was nine years old, uh, Kashiku, which was a member of Sopo, and he was also uh, a, one of the leaders of the Serbian National Defense, and he was killed in the headquarters of the Serbian National Defense in Chicago. So the later on, mm, uh, Sopo people would blame their member Bogoje Panayotovic for this murder. Which is interesting because Bogoj Panayotovic, he came to America with like a recommendation letter from Andrija Loncharic mm-hmm. and then was a close collaborator of Dragiša Kašikovic. Um, so, yeah, the, he had connections, like close connections with some of their most important leaders. Yeah, um, it doesn't, it's, it's not as likely, a, I mean, yeah. uh, it's more unexpected than some of the other, you know, if it was the Yugoslav secret police, some of their infiltrations, yeah, yeah, yeah. which, you know. Yeah. Well, this is also, you know, this created a lot of paranoia among themselves. So some of them later on claimed that even Andrija Loncharic was a Titoist agent. You know, that mm-hmm. when when he was in uh, Yugoslavia and f- spent 15 years uh, in prison there, that he was kind of turned there by them, uh, which would mean that their founder worked for the Yugoslav state security. I don't know. It's a pretty strange claim for them to make. Yeah, but the, this right. the, this is the same with all the Ustasha groups. Once they start, once yeah. things start getting really crazy, they get really paranoid. And then yeah. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. everybody's a front and everybody's, you know. Yeah. Although there is very, a very strange claim there uh, made by Father Kajvic in his memoirs. And this is that uh, Andrea Loncevic himself told him how he's in communication with um, uh, Rankovic. And yeah. Rankovic was one of the most powerful communists in Yugoslavia at the time. He was Serbian, and he was the founder and the leader of the Yugoslav state security um, and, uh, you know, the secret police of Yugoslavia. And because they knew each other be- from before the war, they were neighbors, they were in some kind of a connection. And um, when when Rankovic was, you know, fired by Tito, um, it, it was like in the 60s, and the accusation was that he was like spying on Tito and so on. And he, you know, he was not arrested, uh, but he went like he retired completely from political life. Uh, but there was like some kind of a myth by Serbian nationalists in Yugoslavia that Rankovic, you know, was fired because he was a Serbian nationalist and he had Serbian mm-hmm. interests at his heart and so on. There was also he also had a reputation of being a very kind of a, a strongman Stalinist type, you know, he did yeah. a lot of repression against Albanians in Kosovo and so on. So I guess for that reason, Serbian nationalists liked him. Yeah. But you know, there it's a strange claim that um, this the founder of Sopo was in communication with him, and that Rankovic knew about their activities and sort of you know that, that they had his blessings. That he warned them like, now when I'm fired, like the people who will replace me, they will they will have no like mercy. They will kill you, mm-hmm. so be careful, and so on. So, you know, that's, like, pretty strange, a claim to to be made by one of the leaders of Sopo, you know. Right, right. Um, and for that reason also, you know, Father Kajvic is suspected by some to be, an, like, an Udba, a, a Yugoslav state security uh, uh, agent, by some members of Sopo, you know. Right, right. So it's like, yeah, who knows? Yeah, who's <laughs> who's the agent? This yeah, the yeah, game yeah. they constantly play. Yeah. 
So, um, in I think in 1978, the uh, Sopo gang they planned to do a big bombing of a, like a, I think a hotel uh, in Chicago we, uh, on the occasion of a, the, it was like a, a, a Yugoslav um, celebration there organized by the Yugoslav state. And they planned basically to bomb it and to kill a lot of people there. But um, uh, apparently Bogoe Panayotovic, the guy that they were suspicious of being an agent, but was for some reason a part of this action. Right recorded all of their conversations and had like 80 hours of recordings of their conversations. So they were all arrested. Um, at some point, Kavaya was let go out of prison on bail. Uh, like Serbian organizations gathered like $250,000 for him to get out. Uh, but the trial was still going on. And when he was supposed to go uh, on trial, he decided not to go on trial, but to hijack a plane. Yes. Um, yeah, as and, you do. And, to get uh, Father Kajic out of prison, but he also wanted to get some other, including Bogoe Panayotovic. I don't know why he wanted to get rid of uh, him out of prison because he they suspected him of being an agent who worked against them. I don't know if he wanted to execute him or what, but he also wanted to get uh, some like Nia Ustasha Terris out of prison yeah. because he heard good things from, uh, about them from Kajic, who met them in prison and said they're like, okay, <laughs> uh, which... So, yeah, pretty bizarre. Um, so he hijacks this plane. Uh, at some point, he manages to talk with Father Kajevich, and Father Kajevich refuses to leave the prison and, like, advises him to, uh, you know, give up on this hijacking. Uh, by the way, Kavaya had some crazy idea that when they, he talked over the phone with Father Kajevich, that Father Kajevich gave him some codes and told him, right. like, that he should do this. <laughs> yeah. there is, by saying, like, he, don't do it. No, <laughs> yes. I mean, in the way he describes it, there is no reason to think that that's what Father Kavich told him, but that's what he thought. So yeah. he's quite desperate and angry that, you know, so now the person that he wants to get, uh, you know, uh, let go out of prison doesn't want to leave the prison. He doesn't yes. know what to do. His lawyer, which is this Serbian American guy, joins him in the plane uh, and they get drunk and they don't know what to do. He's quite angry. So he uh, demands another, even bigger plane. And he's given that plane. And they're now flying over the Atlantic. And Kavaya wants to go to South Africa, but uh, his lawyer persuades him to uh, land in Ireland, which he does. Mm. He demands, like, um, asylum there, but they say no, and they deliver him back to America. Even though the cops liked him, and they told yeah. him that they liked him. Yeah. They got drunk. Everyone loved him, yes. Yes. It was great. Uh, so he's back in America, and he, <laughs> And he gets 65 years of uh, prison. Um, this is what he's sentenced uh, to. Uh, but he like he spends time in prison from 1979 to 1997. Who is, so he's eventually let go, and he goes back to Serbia after that illegally and dies right. there, I think, in 2008 or six or something like this. Kajevic, because he didn't hijack a plane and was even against it, he spends a lot less time in prison. I think only eight years of 12 that he was sentenced to. So Kajevic leaves uh, the prison in the end of 80s, I think. Uh, so they had a different... The, the, the American prison system had a different impact on these two guys. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Father Kajevic had a, some kind of a weird half transformation there. He realized how, you know, the prison system is bad, how it's racist. He, he, he like, was in... spent a lot of years in a prison with some black men and became friends with them and called them his family and said that this was a good experience uh, for him because it delivered him from his racism yeah. uh, and also kind of had opinions against the war on drugs and um, the whole American prison system and everything. Although he still was a Reagan supporter, but like he thought that the Reagan regime was bad, but the Reagan himself was a good guy. This I is think he had friends in the administration as well, peripherally. I mean, he knew Reagan himself. Like, uh, yeah, this yeah. Is, oh, right. We, yeah. Unlike Kavaya, Father Kajic became a, kind of a, associated with the um, political establishment of the Republican Party. You know, we talked about it. He claimed yeah, we, he, we really need to make a list at the end of this arc of every single one of these people that Reagan somehow met. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. From, from Reagan making, you know, Croatia Day in California to be the day of the founding of the independent state of Croatia and his various connections to him meeting, you know, 
the the Zog Zog guys. Of course, not yeah, yeah, Zionist occupied government, but the the human being uh, yeah. <laughs> like a Zogu from Albania to like the connections with all these Chetniks. It's it's pretty yeah. rad. It is, yes. Um, uh, Kavich also had this crazy idea how he was imprisoned. In a, this was a conspiracy of the American State Department who wanted him in prison. Uh, after Tito died, because they were uh, for sure thinking how he would get in in, in power in Serbia <laughs> and, yeah, and, right, be, right. and be the leader right. of Serbia instead of Milosevic, which would not be good for America for some reason. Although he is like a friend of Reagan and like a, basically a Republican, I don't know why, but okay, this is his idea. Yes. Um, so uh, he's still alive. Uh, Kavaya him uh, like and Kavic don't like each other, obviously. Uh, Kavaya died in Serbia, an alcoholic, very disappointed in new independent free Serbia, uh, and kind of depressed and so on. So that that was mostly what we talked about so far. I don't want to introduce now a lot, a lot of new information or or any really. But in the next two episodes, we'll focus more on a third Sopo leader, a guy called uh, Bosko Radonjic. Uh, Bosko yeah, Radonjic, finally. <laughs> He's a big younger than they are, born in 43, died in 2011. Mm-hmm. He he left Yugoslavia in 1970, also, I think, through Austria, Germany, and then eventually ended up in the United States, where he, he settled in Hell's Kitchen in New York. Um, so, and he become, became a part of this Sopo crew, you know. Yeah. He, they, bo- both Kajevic and Kavaya mention him, but they don't, you know, say much about him. Um what is mentioned is that you know he he was a part of the New York crew and he was like in the he owned like garages and car car parks car car parking places in New York and that was his like business. Um, he you know had a like kind of I think a suspicious role in some of these like um, activities. Like he was definitely a part of this like uh, the activities the, the like the terrorist activities of Sopo like. He in uh, seventy five he was a part of a bombing of the Yugoslav mission at the UN in New York. Mm. Um, also in the same year, a part of the bombing of a, like a, a home of a Yugoslav diplomat. But uh, when they were arrested in seventy eight, he was actually driving. I think both Fajer Kajevic and Kavaya in his car in New York. Boško Radonjic mm-hmm. was, and then they they went in like to one of his garages and he left something there, like some explosives or something like this. And while he was out of the car, they were all arrested somehow. Mm-hmm. And at, at first, they were scared that it was uh, like some organized crime groups that wanted to kill them. But then they realized it's a, a, the FBI. And this is how they were imprisoned. Now, Boško Radonjic uh, actually admitted that he was a part of some of these things, which is not very gangster or terrorist. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, so he said that he was a part of some of these actions. and he. He spent, I think, less than four years in prison. He was out in 1982. Mm. So the least time he uh, of them he uh, he got um, kind of suspicious. I don't know. Yeah, he he, he it's remained... suspicious also because he's the most well. He's the only one that's very well known still outside mm-hmm. of like Serbian circles or Balkan circles. Yeah, you know, for being like a criminal. It's yes, <laughs> did the least amount of time. Yes, uh, and. Um, so this is, you know, so obviously, so it's interesting now to think. Bosko Radonjic, he remained in good relations with Kavaya. And when, uh, later on, like in the 90s, Radonjic went back to Serbia. So when uh, Kavaya joined him there after, you know, he was let go of prison, uh, Bosko Radonjic was kind of his protector. He had money, so he financed him, provided him a flat and so on. So they were sort of in a good relationship. But Kavaya was also raised some suspicions about Bosko Radonjic. Not very openly, mm-hmm. but raid some. And interestingly, you know, Bosko Radonjic was not in good relations with Father Kajevic and kind of pushed this idea that Kajevic is actually the one who worked for the state, Yugoslav state security, and talked shit about their founder, Andra Lončević, as a possible, also, Udba agent, you know, mm-hmm. that also came from Bosko Radonjic, from what I uh, gather. So, you know, this is interesting, but there is a whole other side to Bosko Radonjic and this is, you know, that he was a part of organized crime. So right. in the in the 80s, after he spent eight, uh, eight years in prison, he 
got involved with the Irish American gang, the Westies, uh, in New York, and eventually became their leader, which yeah. is pretty strange. Yeah. Also, and definitely means you're fucking nuts. Uh, definitely means you're nuts. Yes, uh, yeah. I mean, so you know, Sammy the Bull that I mentioned uh, has a podcast, and he says something like, "How how like a, a, a Serb guy becomes a leader of the Irish gang? I don't know, but there you go." Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and and he says how you know the Westies were like totally nuts and crazy, and, and this is like you know, Sammy the Bull also kind of looks totally nuts and crazy, but in in his opinion, the Westies were like really really like always drunk on drugs uh yeah. like killing people and Ch- chopping like, people up putting them in yeah i asked my friend uh, who knows bags. a lot about organized crime stuff it was just like yeah what about the westies he was like oh yeah they were fucking crazy they kept like you know severed hands and freezers to use for fingerprints and like all kinds of shit mm, yeah. <laughs> And, and so, obviously, there is a mob connection there because they were the allies of the Gambino crime family right. and John Gotti, who Bosch Koradonis personally knew and so on. But, you know, and, and then, and then Bosch Koradonis goes back to Yugoslavia and there is a whole other criminal connection there that's even stranger. And it involves, again, the deep state, a, both the Yugoslav one, but also the CIA possible connections and so on. <laughs> and, and this is something that we'll talk about. The, uh, this, you know, both the American crime story and the Yugoslav one is something that we'll talk about in the next two, three episodes. All right. Oh, yeah. oh, it was good to get back up to speed with, with Sopo and, well, yeah. you know, 19th and 20th century history. But uh, getting back to Sopo, because we had, I had forgotten actually some of that stuff. Now that yeah. um, you know, it's good to get the good refresher there. Yeah. And unfortunately, the whole thing with Kajevic and Kavaya having somewhat similar names, yes, which gets frustrating <laughs> when following their story. <laughs> yes, Fritz like to combine them into yeah. What, what was Kaya- no, uh, Kajeva? Kajeva, I Kajeva, Kajeva, I think. Or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Because he's Kajevic and the other is Kavaya, Ka- Kavaya. and then you were saying, and then you were saying Kai- Kajeva or something. Like that. Yes, that's true. That's true. But yeah, I think yeah, I, I did yeah. settle in the end for Kavayevich to just talk about <laughs> oh, <right>. all of <laughs> them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's also not a bad one. It's yeah. So I don't know. This is like I don't know. This is a pretty insane uh, thing. We went from the black hand to to the mob, yeah. but I mean, early well, on I did teasing mention- that for for. Yeah. <laughs> A yeah. few arcs now. <laughs> Which is I maybe mean, not like early on I did mention Christopher Moltisanti uh when talking about the black hand. So there is an like a there is a similarity there. It's maybe not surprising that eventually some like you know the the inheritors of the black hand will actually be in the mob. So right. in different circumstances, historical. You know, the Cold War is over, so what you're gonna do, you have to do something. Gotta make some money. Yeah. Well, I mean, it wouldn't be the first like uh, political organization like that to slip, dip its feet into organized crime. No, no. I mean, uh, not not the first and least, especially in the U.S. You know. Yeah. 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 I mean, lo- lots of lots of stuff there. Um, I hope this is helpful. I don't know. I hope it doesn't confuse people even more. <laughs> <laughs> um, Always a chance. Chance we we'll have to take. But this was like, in short, what I was trying to say in this arc. Uh, so far is this <laughs> you condensed and, it into one episode as well <laughs> done yeah pretty, over. pretty pretty impressive and now we're complicated even more by introducing all of these crime stuff but yeah but, but i mean some the of these payoff, some of the crime know? stuff i think will be familiar to people people know about who the gambinos are and john Gotti and you yeah. know that kind of stuff yeah 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 and maybe even you know some of our listeners probably know more about the westies than we do oh definitely yeah. definitely yeah all right, well, now I, I guess we're all up to date and ready ready to dive right back in to old Sopo meets the Sopranos. Yes, yes. Yeah, the Sopo Ranos. Is that it? Yeah. All yeah. right, we'll work on it. Yeah, we'll ah, yeah. Sopo Ranos, not bad. Yeah. 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 <laughs> all right, it's your, like your dream episode, isn't it? Can I know. Ray's, <laughs> your Ray's favorite Come things on. here, the Sopranos and fucking Serbian terrorists and monsters. It is up and... this morning, started drinking <laughs> Rakia immediately. Yeah. <laughs> Got yeah. really violent and worked for the CIA. <laughs> oh, that's great. You should do that. Yeah. <laughs> that should be yeah. our new intro music. Uh, but yeah, we I, in this episode, we actually didn't mention that Bosco Radonich is the guy on our on, on the photo on our Twitter uh, account. Yep. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah which sitting is, with standing with James Jesus Angleton. Yeah, that's a bad Photoshop that we did. Yeah, but like, <laughs> look at him and the guys around him, and I mean, tell me that's not so piranhas. Yes, it it's true. <laughs> no, I mean, it's dude's true. like a, a stereotypical mobster, like his appearance, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can hear a mandolin when you look at him, <laughs> or, or a tambourine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. See you. See you later this week. Yeah. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Fritz here from The Empire Never Ended. This has been one of our weekly free episodes for free people. But for premium people, we also have weekly premium episodes, which you can get at patreon.com slash 10 T-E-N-E-P-O-D. And also follow our various social media things in the, in the show description there. Like and subscribe them. Follow them. Like and sub- follow and subscribe. Follow them. Do it.